Hello everyone, and welcome back to another video where we are going to be complex analysising this kind of tricky integral right here. Uh, and I say tricky because uh, depending on what assumptions you make about B and C uh, on the imaginary and real parts of uh, the solutions basically, you get very different results and I mean the same method but slightly different. Uh, so we can factor the denominator real fast. So we can say this is going to be equal to x minus r uh, times x minus s. Uh, but the restrictions we're going to apply just for the sake of this not being a 40 minute video uh, is going to be uh, that so the real part of r uh, and the real part of s uh, are going to be uh, just negative, just less than zero. Uh, and that simplifies things uh, just quite a bit, actually. Uh, let's actually turn our attention to the numerator real fast. Uh, and before I go any further, I should say this was inspired by Maths 505. We love them. We love Kamal. Uh, anyway, uh, the numerator. Uh, if we say e to the theta i, uh, we, I say, <laughs> we just look at Euler's identity. We have e to the theta i is equal to cosine of theta, theta plus i sine theta. And if we let theta equal natural log of x, we end up with e to the natural log of x times i, which by properties of exponents is just x to the i, uh, which is going to be equal to uh, cosine of the natural log of x, and then plus i sine of the natural log of x. And if you take the real part of x to the i, you'll see that we end up with our cosine natural log of x. You could do this integral with sine, but uh, we're doing it with cosine, because yes. I say because yes. Uh, that's the way Mass 505 uh, did it, so if you want to, like, I guess, compare results uh, that way, it's a little bit easier. But actually, on to the complex analysis bit, uh, or complex analysis thing bit. Um, if we look at our contour, we're just going to be using the keyhole contour uh, right here, uh, integrating this way, of course. We love integrating counterclockwise, except around the center one. Uh, <laughs> that was weird. Anyway, um, uh, that's the contour we're going to be using. So we can say our entire, uh, or what we should probably define uh, the integral we, or the integral we're going to be integrating uh, around our contour. Uh, it's just going to be our x to the i over x squared plus b x plus c. Again, with those restrictions. Uh, and also, uh, so to find our actual i, so we're going to call this i, if we take the real part of it, what we'll end up with is this result right here. So if we take the real part of it. Anyway, actually integrating uh, over this contour, uh, what we find is the line integral is equal to, well, i, of course, and assuming, or assuming, uh, I'm going to tell you that the outer circle and inner circle uh, go to zero in the limit. Uh, so we're only integrating uh, back and forth along the positive uh, real axis. And what we have is this line integral is equal to i, but then plus the integral from infinity to zero of x to the i over x squared plus bx plus c. And as this is just a branch cut, we have that extra e to the minus 2 pi term. Or it's really an e to the 2 pi i, but you distribute the i and you get an extra e to the minus 2 pi there. So uh, switching the bounds and adding a negative, we find that our line integral is actually equal to 1 minus e to the minus 2 pi i. And by the residue theorem, this is going to be equal to 2 pi i times the sum of our residues. So this is going to be equal to 2 pi i uh, times the sum of the residues. And we only have two residues. We have a residue at r and we have a residue at s. Uh, and it's probably about time I define what those are, uh, which really isn't anything like super crazy. It's just a quadratic formula, but with um, a being 1. So we have negative b plus the square root of b squared minus 4c all over 2. Taking everything in, we not to add a's everywhere. Uh, and then we have s is equal to negative b minus the square root of b squared minus 4c over 2. So another way we actually could have phrased uh, these assumptions right here, uh, saying like the real part uh, is less than zero, is basically saying that like, you know, b is positive, I suppose. Well, that should be a nice way to put it. I never thought about that before. Anyways, uh, <laughs> moving on, moving on. Uh, well, I'm not doing another take of this. 
Um, what we have then is, um, or, well, we have a residue. So uh, at, say, x is equal to r, what we have uh, as a residue is just going to be, well, we have this, uh, oh, let me, let me write the function up, or you can see the function, right? No, you, no, you can't. Not that. Our function right here, just for reference, is x to the i over x minus r, then x minus s. This right here is just the function we're integrating. So if we, uh, this is just a simple pull, so I'm not going to show an awful amount of work. Uh, but if we kind of multiply by x minus r, that cancels. So uh, kind of plugging in everything, we have r to the i over r minus s. And then at x equals s, we have s to the i over s minus r. So summing them together, we find that our integral is just equal to uh, 1 over 1 minus e to the minus 2 pi. Pi. Uh, yeah, times 2 pi i. Times uh, r to the i minus s to the i. And then over r minus s. It would be so cool if we could factor that, but I'm pretty sure we can't. That's unfortunate. But anyway, this is what we have to evaluate right here, uh, and then take the real part eventually. Um, but essentially what we're going to do is say, well, we're, what we're going to do is invoke what we kind of wrote earlier, this what, to evaluate this r to the i and r, uh, s to the i terms. And that is that if we have some x to the i, that's really just equal to, well, this right here, this e to the i natural log of x. So one way we can actually rewrite this is as... Uh, 2 pi i over uh, r minus s times 1 minus e to the minus 2 pi, and then times r to the i, which is just e to the i natural log of r minus e to the i natural log of s. And this might be the point where you say, hold on, that's a huge red flag. How, what do you mean? We're taking the natural log of a complex number, and yeah, we, we, we kind of are. Uh, and the way we're going to actually do that is by uh, essentially going back to the almost definition of uh, the complex logarithm. And that is namely that the natural log of some z uh, is equal to the natural log of the absolute value of z uh, plus i times the argument of z. And where the argument of z is just the angle uh, it essentially makes with like the positive real axis. Uh, so to really just visualize that, if I were to actually draw this out, uh, say this right here is our point, uh, say that's our z, right? Uh, the argument of that would be basically this angle right here, arg z. That's all arg z is. Uh, and the reason we define it this way is so that whenever you exponentiate both sides, so you raise you know, e to everything right here, what you end up getting is, well, z is equal to the absolute value of z times e to the i arg of z which is essentially just expressing z in polar coordinates because you have magnitude, how far you are away from uh, the origin, and then your direction right here with uh, this e term. Fun little thing, which is really cool, I think. But anyway, um, so invoking this, what we actually find is that, I'm going to just bring this down. I'm not going to write that 20 times. hope that's okay. Uh, e to the, we have the e to the uh, i natural log of the absolute value of r, and then plus i times the argument of, well, z, z, don't listen to me, uh, argument of r, and then minus e to the i uh, natural log of the absolute value of s, i am getting the order right, that's good, uh, plus i times the arg of s. But just for a moment, let's kind of I mean, the, the, these terms right here, the uh, e to the i to the nat natural log of absolute value of s, we, we can kind of evaluate those later. Uh, I'm going to save those because those aren't too terrible. But what I want to focus on now is these argument terms again. What is the argument of r and what is the argument of s? Uh, so I'm going to go back here and, and I'm just going to rewrite our definitions. Uh, actually, wait, are they too far away? Uh, no, never mind, they're right here. I'll rewrite them. Uh, but just notice what we have here. We have, if we split these up into real and complex parts, you'll notice that the real part of both R and S is the same. It's just negative B over 2. 
Uh, but if we have... The part that differs is that square root bit. And the square root bit is the only part of that that can actually be imaginary. It's the only part... Uh, yeah, it's the only imaginary part. Uh, and all that it differs by between R and S is a sign. So what that essentially means is that these are complex conjugates of each other. So, again, if we kind of draw another complex plane, you'll see that and we're assuming that uh, the real part of both these is negative, so that's why I'm drawing these on the left. Uh, you'll notice that if we have like an R here, our S must be down here. These heights must be the same. And, you know, the negative B over 2 would hopefully be the same. I say that facetiously, it is the same. Um, but th what this means is essentially that um, these are complex conjugates of each other. So if we take a look at the angle they make with the axis, right? So if we take a look at this angle right here, R of, say, uh, I don't know, R, I'll let, let that be R for, uh, yeah, that would be R. Yeah, that should be R. Uh, R of R, and let this be R of S, for example. Uh, the angles they make with the axis, these must be the same. But here's kind of the little tricky bit. Uh, normally what you could do in the complex plane, right, is if these were on the right side, you could, if you had a point right here, what you could just say is, oh, oh, this is like a normal triangle, let's just use arctan, right? And you'd be completely right. You, the way you define the argument in this case uh, it's literally just arg of, I don't know, I'll call it z again, arg of z is just equal to inverse tangent of, well, your imaginary part over your real part. I was writing it shorthand. Uh, but, but you get the point. That's literally the angle that it makes, and it makes sense. You just kind of look at it, and yeah, it's just kind of basic trig. But the tricky part is that whenever it's on the opposite side of the, uh, of the imaginary axis, that's when it gets a little bit tricky. And the way we get around this, actually, is essentially by saying, well, hold on, we can, it's not actually bad to find, you know, this angle right here. We can find this angle, I'm a, I don't know, let's call it theta. Um, we can find the angle really easily. We can use that to find, or we can use arctan, or, or express that angle as arctan, excuse me. So we can say uh, that this angle right here is just arctan, and we can define everything else as just in terms of that by adding and subtracting pi, essentially. So the arg of r is just going to be equal to, well, well, what's this whole angle right here? Well, that's just pi, but then minus uh, arctan of, well, our real part over the imaginary part, which now we actually have r and s, uh, we can we can actually write out uh, what those are, so uh, the imaginary part of R is just going to be equal to uh, the square root of 4C minus B squared, since we're already assuming this is complex, uh, over 2. And the real part of R is actually just equal to uh, the real part of S, which is just equal to negative B over 2. And then uh, the imaginary part of R is actually just equal to the imaginary part, or the negative imaginary part of S. So you just stick a negative sign in front of the uh, front of that right there. And you can just kind of see that it kind of directly follows, because the only difference there is the negative sign. So. Anyway, what we have then is the argument of R is equal to the tangent inverse of, well, our imaginary part over our real part. So this right here is just going to be negative... Is that right? Please be right. Yeah. Yeah, it looks right. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, pi minus uh, tangent inverse of our imaginary part divided by our real part. So this is going to be the square root of 4c minus b squared over uh, b. Yes. And the argument of s is going to be something, well, quite similar. <clears throat> the only difference is that it's actually just going to be, well, instead of just this angle right here, what we actually want is this entire angle. So we'll kind of draw it like this. We want that entire angle because our dom uh, the range for our theta is 0 to 2 pi, uh, essentially because we did that branch cut. So what we have instead actually is going to be uh, 
pi, but then plus that arctan uh, term right here. So this right here is going to be pi plus the tan inverse of our square root of 4c minus b squared over b. There should not be a negative sign there. I do apologize. Anyway, what we have then is our arguments for r and s. Uh, so what we can do then is just plug them into this equation right here. Uh, which is going to get a little bit long and messy, but that's all right. Uh, so this bit right here, oh, I can select a pen. Uh, this bit right here, just this bit specifically, not our actual entire integral, is going to be equal to uh, e to the i times natural log of the absolute value of r, and then minus, because we have to distribute the i, uh, minus the argument of, well, r, which is going to be minus pi uh, plus, because the minus is cancel, uh, arctan of the square root of 4c minus b squared all over b. And then what we have is then just minus uh, i natural log, i natural log absolute value of s. And then uh, minus pi minus tan inverse of the square root of 4c minus b squared. Okay, cool. Do, 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 do. Okay, and that's what that is equal to. And this does look quite terrible, but you will notice um, a couple of things. And there's also one more thing that we need to kind of look into before this really simplifies down a lot. Uh, and so the first thing you can notice is that e to the minus pi, that just immediately can be factored out uh, by properties of exponents. So you have e to the minus pi, just right out there. And you'll notice then that what we're left with is almost a nice symmetry. We have an e to like the plus tan inverse, and then we have an e to the minus tan inverse, and that screams hyperbolic sign. And that's almost right, but we have these sort of annoying terms right here, the, you know, uh, e to the i natural log r's and s's. So let's kind of look at what the absolute value of r and s actually are, because if you look at these, well, they really are the same essentially, but let's kind of evaluate it more clearly, I suppose. So we know the imaginary parts of this, and we know, and we know that if we have, you know, the absolute value of some z, this is the square root of, say, the real part of z squared. Uh, plus the imaginary part squared of z, right? And what we have is actually, you know, both the imaginary uh, and real components of these. I mean, so let's just go ahead and calculate the absolute value of r and s. So the absolute value of r is equal to the square root of b squared over 4. So that's just the real part right there, that squared. And then plus this part squared. So uh, 4c minus b squared, and then over 4. And what you'll actually notice, uh, it's a little bit subtle, that the imaginary part of s is just the negative imaginary part of r, uh, and, and whenever we take the magnitude of that, well, I mean, the negative goes away, so these are actually the same, so we, we, we can't say that with confidence. Uh, in simplifying this, you'll actually see that the b squareds over 4 cancel, and what we're left with is actually just the square root of c. Uh, it's just how far away we are, which, it might, which I think is kind of cool. Um, so, what we have then is... Where was I? Um, <laughs> uh, the absolute value of r and s are equal to each other. So we can actually factor that out again. So we have e to the minus pi, but then we have an e uh, to the i times the natural log of the square root of c, uh, and you could probably, right, you, I mean you can, uh, take the one half out, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just going to leave it as the square root of c. Um, so yes, I think it looks nicer that way. And then what we're left with on the inside is e to the tan inverse, uh, I'm going to write all the b's in one term, so this is going to be 4c over b squared minus 1 and then minus e to the tan inverse, or minus tan inverse, pardon me, 
of the square root of 4c over b squared minus 1. And this is essentially the definition of a uh, hyperbolic sine. Just, you know, stick a 2 here and stick a 2 there, and bada bing, bada boom, you have arc sine. Uh, sorry, that's probably, <laughs> probably not the best definition. <laughs> Probably not the best definition of hyperbolic trig. Uh, arc sine is, or arc sine, hyperbolic sine is just defined as e to some e to some x minus e to minus some x over two. Uh, so just to get it in that form, you just multiply the top and bottom by two. I should explain that. Um, but kind of bringing everything together now, what we have then is this. Uh, or actually, I'm I'm gonna bring all of this down. So this um, two pi i over r minus s. Okay. So now what we have is 2 pi, or i, is equal to 2 pi i over r minus s, 1 over 1 minus e to the minus pi, 2 pi, uh, and then we have an e to the minus pi on the top. I'll simplify that, don't worry. And then we have 2, oh sorry, whoops. Uh, actually, I'll throw in the 2 here, that's fine. Uh, 2 times e to the i, natural log of the square root of c, and then times our hyperbolic sine of our tangent inverse of the square root of 4c over b squared minus 1. So now this all just comes down to finding out what on earth e to the i uh, natural log c uh, square root of c is. And we need to take the real part of that, but we, I mean, we, we, we did that up here. If we go all the way back up to the beginning, we already did that. So, what we have then is uh, yeah, what we have is c equal to uh, 2 2 pi, I, or actually, I do apologize. Uh, we do, we do have an, we actually do have an i, uh, Sorry, we do have an i. So instead of sine, uh, or sorry, instead of cosine, uh, this is going to be a uh, negative sine. So what we have then is, or actually, wait, no. <laughs> I've been doing this for too long. I do apologize. We actually are not going to have an, uh, we aren't going to have an i here. And let me explain why. Uh, so this r minus s term, if we go back up, I do apologize. It's been, it's been a rough day recording. Uh, R minus S, you'll see, is actually just, well, um, the, B, the B over 2 terms cancel. And what we're left with is actually just uh, the square root of B squared minus 4C. But we were already assuming that that's complex anyway. So what we basically say is this is I times the square root of 4C minus B squared. So the I's actually do cancel. I do apologize for that, for any confusion. So what we're left with actually is just... 2 pi over the square root of 4c minus b squared. And then I'm going to simplify this term right here um, with this 2 and say that that is uh, 1 over hyperbolic sine of pi. And then taking the uh, real part of this, of course, we have the cosine of the natural log of the square root of c. And then we have times the hyperbolic sine of tan inverse of the square root of 4c over b squared minus 1. And this right here is the final formula. This right here is what, uh, it's kind of like the finale. Boom. We're done. That is our answer right there. Thank you all for watching. A uh, longer video than I intended, but that's all right. Uh, and I will see you all in the next one.